So Gail King. Dr. Phil McGraw. How long have we known each other? Oh, I, we would have to go back to Amarillo. And I first heard about you because Oprah said there's this guy from Texas named Phil McGraw who doesn't hold any punches, who really tells it like it is, and he's making a lot of sense to me. Yeah. And then when I met you, I went, God, I see why you like that Dr. Phil guy. I get it. I yeah. get it. Because you were one of the few people at the time who didn't sugarcoat what was going on in Amarillo and how serious Amarillo and how serious this was? Because Oprah thought, look, listen, I'll just get there and I'll tell the truth, um, and I'll let them know what happened. And you said, well, that's one way to do it. <laughs> you yeah. have to know what you're dealing with, and there's a there's a way to tell the truth effectively. Yeah, is what you said. Yeah, you tell remember the truth that? Of, yes, because you said when the rubber meets the road, you're going to get your ass handed to you. That's yeah. a direct quote. Yeah, that's a direct quote. Yeah. But there is a big difference between telling the truth and telling the truth effectively. Effectively, yeah. Because words are powerful, exactly, right? Exactly, as we know today. Words are, yeah, we'll talk about that because words are powerful. I always tell people, look, I hear people all the time on the show catastrophize. They come in and say, oh, my life is horrible. I say, yeah. really, what's happening? Well, my spouse, they don't talk to me enough or my kids are rude. I say, you know, that's not horrible. Yeah. Come with me to the children's burn unit at Parkland. Yeah. That's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. That, the other is inconvenient. Yeah. Words are powerful. Don't use words like horrible, terrible, catastrophe, if it doesn't apply. But you know what? This reminds me of something, Phil, of uh, what Maya Angelou said. May she rest in peace. My mom had died. I was going through divorce. And I said, Maya, it just can't get any worse. This is horrible. She said, stop it. And I go, what do you mean? She said, take it back. I go, take what back? This is not horrible. You want to know what horrible is? Did you get up this morning? Did you g get out of bed on your own two feet? Do you have feet? Do you have clothes? I mean, you know, she went through a whole litany of things. Yeah. By the time it was over, I go, okay, well, I guess it's okay that my mom died. I'm going through <laughs> yeah. a divorce. Yeah. Like, <laughs> she said, I'm not saying that, but don't say this is horrible. Yeah. That's not, to, so to your point, that's what made me think of that. One of my favorite things that she said was, we did what we knew how to do, and when we know better, we, we do, do better. better. Yeah. Isn't that great? Yeah. That's such a wise yeah. thing. Yeah, and so true. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite things comes from your dad, who said, because you've quoted him a lot on the show, when you said, if you knew how little people thought about you— <laughs> How seldom they thought about yeah. you. How, yeah, how, they don't spend a lot of time thinking about you. You might have a very different perspective of things. Yeah. You knew you how get seldom so people thought yes. of you, you wouldn't worry so much about it. Yes, yeah. which I think is good. Yeah, which is true. Yes. I mean, we all think the world revolves around us, right? <laughs> it's so true. So how are you? Tell everybody how you're doing. Well, I have to say I really love what I'm doing, Phil, but the, the schedule really does kick my butt. It really, really does. Because I have two full-time jobs. I get up at, you know, 322 every morning because um, I have it down to a precise science and I need two snooze alarms. And then I go from here to CBS this morning over to Oh, the Oprah magazine. I've been there since the very beginning. Right. So I really love it. But, you know, my schedule's a lot, a lot. But I can't have a don't cry for me Argentina, Yeah. honestly, because I could, you know, I'm doing something that I really, really love to do. Did you think... CBS This Morning would be as successful as it is when you started it? You know, I really didn't know. I mean, I thought that the team that, that we were putting together, which was me and Charlie and Erica Hill and then uh, after Erica, Nora, I did think that there was something very special about that team. But, you know, I wasn't looking for this. That's what I marvel at. I wasn't even looking for this. Right. And so I got this opportunity and, and here we are. But I'm really excited that it's it's doing well, knock on wood. And, you know, I was very nervous, but it wasn't nervous about can I do it. It was just nervous about you want it to be good. You know, you really want to hit it out of the park. And, you know, there's no explaining chemistry. No, but that show now, the way you have it configured now, is the best it's done in 50 years. Yeah. I yeah. mean, this I mean, this isn't like. Oh, it's kind of drifting in the right yeah. direction. This is the best it's done yeah, in fifty you're years. Exactly right on. Why? Listen, we haven't been we haven't been in the game since Captain Kangaroo. Right. And you and I both remember Captain Kangaroo. Yes, and we when do. when I first started at CBS this morning, Phil, they didn't even mention us. 
It was always Good Morning America and the Today Show. They, and I would say, geez, can't they just mention us? Yeah. So now we're at least getting mentioned. Right. And why do I think it's working? Because I do think when we say the news is back in the morning, A, we mean it. And I think people are interested in that. You know, I'm not, I, I don't, you don't have to worry about cooking. You don't have to worry about costumes. You don't have to worry about you know, things that some people would consider frivolous. It may work at other uh, at other stations, at other networks, but it's not what our audience wants. Every time we veer off of that, I remember when Kim Kardashian had her baby, and I like Kim. Um, I think she's a very sweet girl. And I said, can we just mention the baby? Can we just mention that she had a baby? People are talking about it. They go, well, you know, Gail, that's just not the audience. That's, you know, and yeah. someone on the team said, has she had the baby yet? I go, the baby's now a year <laughs> because they were planning the party. Can we just mention the baby? They go, but, you know, that's not what this audience wants. So I'm very mindful of that, about what the audience wants. Well, let me ask you this. You've been doing it now for how many years? I was three years in Kansas City, starting in 1979, uh, anchoring the news. And then I was in uh, Hartford, Connecticut. I was there for 18 years. Yeah. So I've been doing it a long time. Yeah. And you've been doing CBS. Si for six years. You've been doing this for six years yeah. now. So tell me this. What does America want to hear? I mean, you guys do the news. It's not a circus. It's not an entertainment show. Yeah. You do the news. Yeah. And so what news do people want to hear? What have you learned? What do people want to hear? I do think they want to know. That's why I like this job so much. You go to bed at night, you get up in the morning and it's changed. And we could be the first persons that you're hearing about. You know, news is 24 seven, sometimes it's 24 seconds and seven seconds. You could go to the bathroom, fill and come out and it's changed. Yeah. I mean, that's how quickly the news has changed. So I do think they want to know what has happened overnight. I think they want to have some idea about what's coming up. But, you know, I also think people like a little bit of fun. And I think that you can be entertained and you can you can inform and not be a comedy team. We're never trying to be a comedy team. But I think it's okay to have a sense of humor. And dare I say, I think it's okay sometimes to be corny. Sometimes, Phil, corny works. Yeah, of course. Somebody asked me one time, I'm absolutely certain they were trying to insult me. They said, <laughs> isn't it true a lot of what you do is entertainment? Oh. And I said, well, I hope so. I do tell compelling stories because if I just get up and say, okay, today we're going to cover the five points of forgiveness, yeah. my own mother wouldn't listen to yeah. that. But if I tell a compelling story yes. that requires forgiveness and talk about and how they had points. to, yeah. it covers the points, but it shows the challenges they had to go through to forgive, then and it hooks people and they listen to the story then the learning sneaks up on them. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, it's entertaining. I said, I hope so. If not, nobody will watch. Well, the beauty of your show is there's nobody who can do what you do in terms of being a, you know, I often, audience, I often uh, email or text Phil to say, how do you yes, hold your face on straight? with some of the stuff that I see coming out of people's mouth. And I and I can always tell. I'll be sitting at home and I go, oh, he's going in. Because somebody will talk and you'll <laughs> yeah. go, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then you, say, then you say whatever it is you're going to say. Half the fun for me is watching you talk to the people that are on the show in, a different, in addition to yeah, the story. I got one so, just recently. You said, I had to stop the treadmill, yes. get off, and ask you, how are you holding your face? Treasure, yes. who was a black girl right. who said that she was white— Looking like a black girl, I have to say, saying, standing there telling America that she was actually white. And her attitude was bad, Phil. She very was racist. Very, she was very flip, but more than being racist, I couldn't tell if she was trying to be cute or if she was trying to be entertaining. You know, I, I thought her mother didn't handle it well. You know, her brother tried to. I, I found myself, and I'm getting all caught up in treasure story <laughs> when I go, okay, calm down, calm down. But I, I did. I had to stop. I got off the treadmill because that's when I watch you, Phil, on the treadmill. Um, I had to stop the treadmill in the middle just to say, what in the world? People watch sometimes and they don't realize how many moving parts. I know you do because of what you do. But there are moving parts. You know, there's the guest. There's the mother. There's the audience. I'm thinking about what's going to happen when she goes back to school the next day. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to rehabilitate her. You tried to help her, but she didn't want the help. No. No. I thought it was you had the twins too, the one twin who's surviving who just went over the cliff. And you go, now nah, didn't it? You didn't you all have an argument? And uh, 
the car went over. Isn't that what happened? And I almost thought she was going to tell you. Yeah. I almost thought there was a look in her eye. I thought she wanted because you go, that, isn't that what happened? She said, that's part of what I remember. Yeah. yeah. That's part of what I, I remember. I thought she was going to tell you. You know, some people can't get out of their own way. No, you had the other lady on who was just lying, lying, lying to her husband about uh, something on social media where she said that she was being stalked or something. And you said, but you sent those to yourself. She goes, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. And she actually tried to leave in a huff. Yeah. And then she came back. Yeah, got to the airport and turned and came back. Then she came back. And yeah. I was shocked that she came back. Yeah, because he took my advice. I said, she's lying. Yeah. And you're an idiot. Yeah. And you need to get away from her as fast as you can. And he got to the airport and said, we're taking different planes. I believe him. You're out of here. And she said, whoa, oh, oh, whoa. Oh, that's what happened? Because so, oh, we just we just saw them come back. Yeah. And I just thought, wow. Because it was so clear she was lying. This is what amazes me, Phil. That people will just out and out lie to your face when they know that they're lying and know that you have proof that they're lying. I'm always curious about those stories. Yeah, you know, I've spent my life developing deception detection techniques. I can tell and you when tell people, people are that lying. Too. That's what's funny. You know, I'm sort of trained in this. Yeah. I say, can I take a lie detector? I say, I am a lie detector, <laughs> and you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> and and you call them out. But I have to say, as blunt as you can be, and you can be blunt, I always do feel that you give people their dignity. You know, you're never trying to humiliate. No. You just call you, never. You're never trying to humiliate. You just really call them as you see them. You know, a friend will tell you if you've got broccoli in your teeth. Yes, yes, yes. A friend will tell yes. you if you smell like a goat. Yes. You tell people the truth. Do I smell like a goat? <laughs> I Gail, did. I was going to mention it today. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I, I'm still watching. I'm still watching and well, taping. you are the fan. Yeah, I catch up on the weekend. Sometimes I used to be able to watch every day after, but the schedule's very difficult. Yes, it is. So I do a lot catching up on the weekend. Are you worried about America? Very. What scares not, not you the most? Phil, not only am I worried about America, I'm very afraid and very sad about America. You know, I was at a dinner party Saturday, and, and that's all anybody was talking about, the shooting in the synagogue. I feel that we have gotten so amped up and so vitriolic and so mean, and we're not being cur- we're not being encouraged to appeal to the better angels. Everybody says, "Oh, it's bad, it's bad, it's bad," but I don't see anybody who's out there leading us to a better way, and that's what scares me. That's what scares me. Are you worried about anything in particular other than the vitriol, or is it just that? We don't have anybody pumping the brake right now. Both, both. And I'm worried about, um, you know, if I was at CNN, I'd be terrified. I'm sort of terrified even working at CBS. And we haven't even been a target uh, for the president directly. But, you know, they're covering the story and they have people going, CNN sucks. I mean, and it just riles people up. So on one side, we're fake news and it's fake news. If you say something unflattering about the president of the United States or he disagrees with what you're saying, then you're fake news. On the other hand, you look at the work of the media and what they've done about the the story in, um, in, in, in Pennsylvania about the Catholic Church, how they've uncovered that and how the 60 Minutes piece last night where the whistleblower, the whistleblower who was working with a bishop, Because she had gone to the bishop to say, you know, I'm getting these calls. This is very upsetting to me. We're not doing anything about it. These priests are being moved around. And the bishop said to her, it's not your concern. Don't worry about it. It's not your concern. She got so, and this was a devout Catholic who adored this bishop. She got so concerned about it, rather than going to the police, because I said, why didn't you go to the police? She said, I was worried about more kids getting hurt. So she went directly to the media. And the media did the story right away. And now I, I think there will be some changes there. Yeah. I mean, so don't tell me that we're enemy of the people and don't tell me that we're fake news. It's a bit, So I, I'm, I'm afraid and I'm very concerned. I, it's OK to disagree, Phil. I don't care if you disagree with me, but I think that we can do it without hating each other. And I feel that we live in a society today that we disagree and there's there's active hate, which is a perfect example of what happened with the shooting in the synagogue. Well, the thing that worries me is that w- with all of this violence that we see, and you can't 
lay all of this at the president's feet. No, you can't. I'll give you an example of what I mean about the power of language, particularly when you put it with an authoritative source. Mm -hmm. I cannot go on my air and say, it's okay to spank your child even a little bit. Some people might say, I don't believe in spanking my child, but if they're running out into the street, I might grab them and swat them and say, don't do that, Mm -hmm. you know, just to kind of get their attention. I can't even say that. Why? Because some mouth breather is going to hear that and say, Dr. Phil says it's okay to spank your child, and they're going to use that to justify beating their child. They won't put it in context? They will take that and use it to justify an extreme intervention with a child taking it too far. So what I've learned is you have to say all or none, because if you leave it to a matter of degree, those that want to exploit it, those that are looking for a justification, they will take that grain and use it to justify doing something extreme. And that's what happens when you have a president or a judge from the bench in a custody hearing or a teacher Mm -hmm. or a bishop or someone that somebody looks at as being somewhat authoritative, Mm -hmm. saying that something is okay, they will then put that through their filter and it comes out the other side very different than it went in. And I have learned I cannot allow for that to go through a filter, so I have to say none. Wow. And then there's no way for them to misinterpret that. But that's too bad, though, to me, Phil, because it, that makes it sound like it's black or white. And as you know, there are area of, uh, areas of gray, like if they're running into the street and I want to grab them and, and, and say, swat them and say, look, you can't do that. I, I, I don't know. I, I think people are missing out on good advice. But I've had to weigh that. And I'm just telling you, if you have a child that undergoes years of abuse mm-hmm. and you get quoted as a source, yeah. you go, you know yeah, what? I hadn't thought about it There's that way. other ways yeah. to go about it. So when the president gets up and says, fake news and we ought to kill this guy, he had somebody at one of the events mm-hmm. and said, that guy ought to get mm-hmm. dropped a few times on mm-hmm. the way out or whatever mm-hmm. he said. And, and said, then, I will pay for your legal bills. <laughs> Yeah. Early in the campaign. I mean, come on. Here's the thing. A lot of people will say you're too easy with the president or you didn't do this with the president. Piers Morgan got criticized for being too soft with the president. I asked him about that and he said, you know what? People don't understand. You start asking hard questions. (laughs) Your ass is out on the sidewalk (laughs) about the third question. So if you want to get something out of the president, you've got to spoon feed and walk along Mm -hmm. very gently. Because if you start saying, isn't it true? Mm -hmm. You're talking to yourself out on the sidewalk in three seconds. They'll have you out of there before God gets the news. Yeah, but you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do the isn't it true. There's enough just to sit and talk. I have ways to getting to the truth. You do. Speaking of the truth, can I just say something about you did a show on catfishing? Yes. I was so bummed because it was preempted. A big chunk of it was preempted on the East Coast. And it was a woman, her nephew and her her nephew had brought her in. And she was talking about she had sent money and she refused to believe. She refused to believe that this guy was catfishing her. It was on very recently. Right. And then you said, OK, and, and you, you laid it out. We went here. We went here. He doesn't exist. And then she was like, you did that for me? You did that? Oh, my gosh. And she sat there like this. She was annoying to me. Yeah. I was just wondering, was she annoying to you? I'm sorry for her situation. But she was. there was just something about her, Phil. I'm not going to name any names. I know exactly what you're talking about. Even though I remember her name, I'm not going to name it. She was annoying in that people that love her and were helping her, she was belligerent. Yeah, she, but she didn't ring true to me. But then she would turn around to a complete stranger Yes. who did half of what her family had done. Yes. And say, oh, you're, you're so grateful. Yes, yes. Her nephew's sitting like, yeah. what am I, chop liver? Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I will say this. She did take the advice. She did. She did cut ties. Okay, good. And she did change her numbers, that. and she did stop the okay, contact. I am glad about that. So I will say at least she did that. She heard you. It, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah she that heard That doesn't you. mean she won't be there again, but. 
she maybe, heard you. Maybe not. What's the most fun about what you're doing on the air? I like having a front row seat to whatever happens in the world. Isn't that great? I think so, Phil. I like having a front row seat. you got a press pass to life. Oh, I'm going to use that. Oh, I'm going to so use that. Can you give me a piece of paper so I can write that down? And guess what? I won't be crediting you. It's no. a press pass to life. There oh you my go. Gosh. You can write that down. I am. I am. I am. But 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 isn't that true? Yes. I know. I always say I have a front row seat um, to whatever's happening. You know, I walk in my house. The first thing I do is turn on the TV. Yeah. The first thing I do when I get up in the morning, you know, the TV, quite often I fall asleep to the TV on and it's still on when I wake up. I have a TV in just about every single room in my house, including the bathroom. I like knowing what's going on in the world. What's it like to be able to walk in anywhere to any event, to anything that's going on, and be able to walk in, walk up, observe and report on anything that's going on anywhere in the world? I say it's a privilege, but I also know that it's a big responsibility and I don't take it lightly. I don't, t- you know, I don't take for granted. W- talk about words have power. I know very, very well when we're sitting there on that at that anchor desk on CBS this morning, you better be very careful about what you say. You better be very, um, and I take it seriously. You know, listen, all of us who are reporting the news have an opinion. But what I know is, in most cases, the audience isn't interested in hearing my opinion. That's why I miss radio so much, because you really can just give your opinion and solicit, have conversations. You're not there to give your opinion, because the power of your words have meaning. And that's never lost on me. But to answer your question, what's it like? It's a kick. It's a kick. To, to be able to really go just about anywhere in the world and and be able to report the story to someone else is a huge kick for me. I yeah. still, you know, Oprah teases me about, you know, God, local news doesn't get old to you. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. You know, I, from the time I was first starting to report about the police chief or the fire department or something that's going on, I just, I love being that kid yeah. and still do. Do you notice the whole time we've been talking that I never brought up Oprah's name? I didn't notice it. Yeah. Uh Uh-uh. Is that a bad thing? No. Oh. Does it bother you that some people define you as Oprah's friend? No, because (laughs) can I ask what's bad about being her friend? Yeah. Really? What's bad about being her friend? That's my point. Yes, I know. I I look at both of us sitting here. You know, we first. Because I'm damn sure her friend. Yes, and we first people first learned about us on the Oprah Show. Absolutely. And and that has never been to me a negative ever. Mm-hmm. So no, that that doesn't bother me. That doesn't bother me at all. You know, this is so funny. People ask me all the time, well, "Are you going to? You should write a book." I go about what? And they go, "Oh, you could write about anything." And I said, "For instance, what?" You know, I just don't think it's all, I'm all that interesting. Well, what if you wrote a book about friendship? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I'm going to pass. So, no, that doesn't bother me at all. The reason I said that is because I let you bring it up because I know people in Oprah's life, and I'm one of them, mm-hmm. and I know me, and I know how hard I work. I know how hard you work. I know how prolific Stedman is. Mm-hmm. Oprah surrounds herself with people that are smart and sharp and hardworking. Mm-hmm. She's not an entourage no, kind of person. No, that no. is the last no, thing in the world no, she's that not. Oprah is. She's down to earth and she likes who she likes and doesn't who she doesn't. And that's yeah, what it is. But, you know, I feel this feel. I feel, you know, for the most part, people would have no clue unless you were in Connecticut or Kansas City where I actually anchored the news. Mm-hmm. Um, you would You would not know my name. So I'm okay that for many people, they they first got to know me because I'm her friend. But I also think that will only get you so far. They're not going to give you a job because you're somebody's friend right. un- unless they feel that you can deliver. So, right. I, you know, it's so funny. When I got this job and I was on the air, people would write me and go, wow, you are so good. How did you learn to do that so quickly? <laughs> Yeah. Which was funny. How did you learn how to do I go, uh, You're an overnight yeah. national success. God, I mean, it's yes, it's a miracle. How did you learn to do I go, uh, well, I had actually had it. You had a job? <laughs> you know, you know, a lot, for some people say, I didn't even know what your last name was. You have a last name? So, you know, that was very gratifying to me. You, Gosh, you, you picked it up so quickly. Well, I've been doing it a long time. Yeah. But that's okay. That's all right. 
I say I say about myself and that you know I see myself standing in her light, not in her shadow, and it's a really good light to stand in too. Isn't it the just? <laughs> yes, it's very bright. Yes. And I tell her that all the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do. I hate. I don't use that word a lot, but I hate people that forget who gave them a hand up, who helped them, who she helped lifted with them Phil. up. You got the goods, though. You had the goods. You know, it just started out with Tuesdays with Phil, wasn't it? Were you mm-hmm. just on Tuesdays? Yeah. Right. You had the goods. You had the goods. Well, I've always said Oprah can lift you above the noise, Uh huh. but you got to stay up there. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I just read you signed a new contract to 2023. I did. So you're not tired. No, I'm not tired. Why are you not tired? Because how many years has it been? I'm in the 17th season now, plus five on Oprah. Why are you not tired? I'll ask the questions around here, woman. (laughs) I'm not tired because we keep freshening things up and we are doing a lot of news stories now. Yeah, I like that. And we're doing stories that we probably couldn't have done if Oprah was still on the air Uh because when people want to tell their story, they want to tell it to the biggest audience they can Mm -hmm. to have the biggest impact they can. Mm -hmm. And that was Oprah. Well, well, now it's the Dr. Phil show. Yeah. I like when you do news stories. I like when you talk to the people about something that's going on. I I actually enjoy that. Because I try to bring a different perspective to it. I'm not a day and date show. Mm-hmm. So you, Gail, will report the news the morning of. Mm-hmm. I can come in two or three days after, and as Paul Harvey used to say, here's the, the rest, rest of the of story. The story. Yeah. From a forensic standpoint, yeah. here's the impact on everybody that was involved. Here's why they did what they did. Yeah. Here's what yeah. happens when the cameras go away, the lights mm-hmm. turn off, mm-hmm. the satellite truck pulls away. Mm-hmm. Here's the aftermath. Here's yeah, what this You can means. even do it a month or two later when people are really sometimes not ready to talk in the beginning. Yeah. And then sometimes, then by then, they've had a chance to take it all in. Yeah, I like that. It lets you go behind the headlines and tell people what's really mm-hmm. going on. Mm-hmm. And both are important. You got to tell people what happened, and then you have to tell people what's happening. Mm-hmm. Those are two and, important yeah. but very different things. Yeah. And that's what keeps me from getting bored because in the beginning, We didn't do a lot of that. We did a lot of evergreen staple type shows. And now we pepper in these things and it keeps me from getting bored because I don't know what's going to happen today that I might be talking about next week. And what you know is something's going to happen. Absolutely, it's going to happen. Yeah. You will never run out of topics, I will say that. No, Because somebody's always either doing something stupid or they need help or somebody's doing something great that you're going to want to report on. And the good thing is I have a very broad lane psychology, that kind of applies to everything. Yeah. I mean, it applies to your career, yeah. yourself, your marriage, your parenting, yeah. your yeah. kids, your, your relationships. I mean, yes. just everything. Your so job. it's a broad lane. Yeah. yeah, it really is. So again, I'd say you, you won't run out of topics. I certainly hope not. When you approach a story, how do you keep your feelings out of it? How do you keep your political leanings out of it? How do you keep your emotions or your biases out of it? I just do. It's it's not something that I have to work and think about and say, got to be careful here because I'm very mindful what my job is. Now, you know, we'll sometimes get a story that's so horrific, like the synagogue shooting, or for me, it was a Newtown shooting with the kids as it affected everybody. But I was, I'm a Connecticut resident. I was, a, you know, I anchored the news in Connecticut for 18 years. So I know that that state very, very well. So, you know, that's one of those stories that just affects you very personally. But I just know that that's not my job to give my opinion. And I'm just very mindful of that. It's difficult sometimes, but I know that's not my job. So that's not a hard, that's not a hard struggle for me. It's hard to not be emotional, though, sometimes when you see the pain and the suffering that are there. But I don't think that's giving an opinion. I think that's just being a human. Human being. That's what I say, too. Yeah. I was just going to say, there's nothing wrong with a little emo- emotion when you feel it when something is just horrific. Yeah. yeah and, and I said to somebody once, I make no apologies. for. I actually use that as an example. I make no apologies for being a human being. Yeah. And so if I get docked for that or people criticize that or say it's unprofessional, which some people do think, I, I, I make no apologies for being a human being. Yeah. Well, you're not a news robot. Yeah. All right. Seriously, people do want to get news from somebody that tells the entire story. And mm-hmm. there's the event. There's the impact. 
there's the emotion, mm-hmm. there's the turmoil, there's the chaos. And if you just are one dimensional, that's not a very interesting account of the mm-hmm. events. You I don't agree. feel like you're there. You don't feel like you've been part of I agree. what happened or have an understanding of what happened. I agree. Now, when you went to school, you studied psychology. Yeah. You were going to be a child psychologist. Yes, I was. Because, Phil, I still like still like listening to people's problems and giving unsolicited advice. You can yeah. ask Kirby and Will about that. They're now 31 and 32, and I always have an opinion about something. But I've always liked listening to people's problems, or I actually thought I'd be good in law school, too. I, I could see myself arguing a case before a jury, trying to convince the jury whatever my position was. And I got hooked on TV in a very happenstance way. I was working at a camera store next to a TV station, and then I became hooked. You said you walked into a newsroom. Yeah. And you got high on the urgency. Yes. It was a breaking news day, and it was fascinating to me because, you know, when you're a a layperson walking in, it looks very chaotic. Yeah. And, you know, what are people doing? And and you you would hear a countdown, 10 seconds, 5 seconds, 2 minutes. I thought, how are they going to pull this together in 2 minutes? How are they going to do this in 10 seconds? And, you know, that red light comes on and you got to be red to go. But I was so fascinated by that and where they were getting the information from and putting the newscast together. I thought, how do they do this? And, you know, I was in college. I'd been watching the news news station. So it was fascinating to me to see people in person that I'd seen on TV. To this day, when people come in and they see me in person, I, I'm always sort of taken aback when they're surprised to see me talking to them. Yeah. I mean, doesn't that get you where they go, oh, my God, I, I can't believe. But you're here in the building where I work. But you're talking to me. Well, well, I'm talking to you because you're. I'm, I'm, that always takes me aback a little bit. Yeah. But, but I remember the first time I saw somebody on camera who, you know, in person that I'd seen on camera. I was like, wow, there's J.C. Hayward. <laughs> wow, there's Bruce Johnson. Then what you know, what we all know is. We're just people, too, Yeah. with the same issues as everybody else. It's just that more and more people may know our names. But the power of television is amazing and scary at the same yeah, time, right? right, right. It's very, very, it's a bit, it's, I think this job, Phil, is a big responsibility. That's what I think. It is a big responsibility, and I take it as a big responsibility because I know People that watch me are very likely to take my advice. Yes. That's why I said what I said about spanking. They can distort it or they can use it or they can abuse it, but there's a good chance somebody is going to take that advice and use it. So I have to be very judicious about About what I say. Well, you're very free to give your opinion. And even when you can tell somebody is is, uh, not telling the truth or just... BSing you, you. I always, I'm always fascinated by how you're going to handle something when it's so clear to everybody else. You, I've never, I rarely see you get angry at somebody. You know, when you get angry, if somebody insults your staff. Oh, I don't like that. Oh my gosh, then no, I don't. We like see that. a different side of Dr. <laughs> Phil McGraw. Yeah. And you well, say, wait a second, you can say what you want about me. <laughs> you're like, you cannot, ins-, and then you bring out tapes to prove it. Where they said, no, your staff said so. Oh, is that what my staff said? Okay. Could we call up tape number da 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 yeah. That's That's one of the few times where I see you get angry if they insult yeah. your staff. Well, you know, or I get a notebook. question your integrity, yeah. I get a notebook that thick. And Which I you read, actually study. I read every word of it. I know you So do. I know where they said it or they didn't. Yeah. And I know my staff has been there till 4 a.m. Don't you dare yeah. call them no, a liar. that's one time, when, a few yeah. times where I see you actually, where you can see that the anger is palpable. Yeah. <laughs> I don't cotton much to pick yeah. it on my people. Yeah, no, I see that. But can't blame me for that. No, 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 no. I mean, no. Uh, uh, uh. I'm just saying, you want to see another side of Dr. Phil? Say something insulting about somebody on his team. Yeah. If you oh, don't like Lordy. that, say something about my wife. Yes. <laughs> well, I don't know anybody who says anything about Robin about other than, it's so great to see her every day, and <laughs> yeah. doesn't she look lovely? Yeah. I'm controversial. Everybody like loves her. Robin. Yeah, I know. I like when you have her on. She's a smart woman. I can't believe she's been to every show, too. Every single show. I know. 2,800 so far. I know. I can't believe Never that. missed. I can't believe it. She can have a toothache or the flu. It doesn't matter. <laughs> she's there to support me, which I think is amazing. 
absolutely amazing. When it started, were, was it always a plan that she would come to every show, or was she just going to come in the beginning for it a It was minute? never a plan. They always have you do... Test shows. Test shows. Yeah. In fact, they scheduled 10 test shows. Mm-hmm. We used all 10. You did? Uh, yeah. We used all 10 test shows. I you mean, did? Yeah. <laughs> We used them all. Most people we know have a test show and they go, it's never going to see the light of day. <laughs> yeah. They used all yours. Wow. Yeah, we used 10 out of 10. And I re- but Wait, before you finish, I remember Phil going to doing a story before the show launched and said, are you nervous? And you said, no, I'm not nervous. You said, nope, I'm not nervous because I think we have something here. I don't get nervous like that. I get focused. I get up for it. You know, I might get butterflies in the sense of getting adrenaline to mm-hmm, do it, mm-hmm. but I don't get nervous. Wow. I've never heard of anybody that used all 10 test shows, though. Yeah. I've never heard that. Well, I had a great team. I've got the same executive I producer name. I started yes. with. I've got yeah. the same seven cameramen I started with day one. Well, one of them actually passed away last year, oh. so I've got six out of the seven. i got the same director. I've got every. I mean, everybody's there. Got the same supervisors, got everybody. You know, nobody leaves. Well, that's a testament to you, though. And they believe in what we're doing. Yeah. You know, they believe, they believe in the work. They believe in what they're doing and what you're doing for sure, but they also enjoy working for you. So you could believe in what you're doing and have a jerky boss. Yeah. And it could get to the point where you say, I believe in what we're doing, but I can't take him or her. I got to go, even though I love this job. So yeah. it clearly is a testament to you, too. We laugh a lot. Yeah, I know. we do. I mean, sometimes it's gallows humor. Yeah, <laughs> you know when it's something terrible, but we do laugh a lot. You said something I thought was interesting. You said that you worry some about backlash of the Me Too movement. Yeah, what's your worry? Because Phil, you know, a woman makes a charge, right, and the man instantly gets the death penalty. And I, you know, speak of. Talk about black and white. I think there are a lot of gradations. And it it does bother me that in in some cases, you know, it's ready, aim, fire. And the guy, there's no due process. There's no second chance. In some cases, there's no investigation. And so I do worry about that. On the other hand, I also believe that most women don't make these stories up. I believe most women don't make these stories up. But for instance, I'll give the example that I was thinking about um, when I said that. Aziz Ansari. I just think that girl just had a bad date. And we've all had those. A guy makes a pass at you. You're not interested. And you say, you know, knock it off. I'm not interested. She ended up, she did leave. I mean, now he's lumped into one of the jerky men of the Me Too movement. And I, I, that bothers, and I don't even know Aziz Ansari. You know, I've met him, but I can't say I know him. I, I look to some degree about uh, Al Franken. I don't. I can't even say I know him either. But I just thought he did something that was stupid, immature, and sophomoric. That picture. Where it looks like he's grabbing a woman's breast. Yeah, yeah. But he 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 wasn't touching them. It was just a stupid thing to do. It was back. They were all comedians. They were traveling around. It was someone that he knew. And and next thing you know, he loses his Senate career. That I I actually thought that that was. Is there no way to have a discussion here? It's unfortunate, though, because his his issues came at the same time they were fighting the Roy Moore case in Alabama. So it turned, in my opinion, it turned into a political issue for him. How can the Democrats support Al Franken and then take down Roy Moore? Well, I thought they were two totally different cases and they all got lumped in together. So I do I do worry about it. But I'm glad there's been a Me Too movement. I'm glad that women are speaking up. And I think young women coming up today won't have these same issues. It clearly is timely. It clearly is needed. Yeah. But I worry not just in this, in all things, there's the concept of guilt by accusation. Yeah. I don't care who you are when we are a headline society. Yeah. We are an ADD Headline society. Because people don't read the whole story, as you know. They don't read the whole story, yeah. and they never read the retraction. Yeah. Because yes. the headline yes. is three-inch screamer, yes. and the retraction is on page 17. And it's and this big. It's yes. two column inches. Yeah. They don't read that, and you don't get a second chance at a first impression. When there's an accusation leveled, and particularly if there's a zeitgeist at the time, there's a mob mentality where everybody is 
guilty, 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 and then you get thrown in to the guilty zeitgeist by accusation, you're toast. It doesn't matter whether you were even in town. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You're toast. All you got to do is get accused, it, exactly. and you can be absolutely ruined, exactly. and that is dangerous. Exactly. And not just me, too. It doesn't matter whether it's a priest in a sexual situation or it's somebody cheating on their taxes or a Wall Street person that supposedly was caught up in the junk bonds. It doesn't matter what the scandal of the day is. If you get accused during that zeitgeist, you're in a lot of trouble. And that's a scary thing psychologically. And right now we're in the zeitgeist. And I just think we, I think we should all just be very careful. You know, and when you say that, people get very mad. Women in particular get very mad um, because they think, you know, that it's a that you're not standing up for women. I think quite the opposite. I'm just saying, you know, there are always two sides to every story, and I just want us to be careful about it. That's all. I worry a woman can get marginalized, which is totally unfair to her. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, to some degree, I agree with that. But on the other hand, I go, when I hear men say, I'm confused, I don't know what to do, I don't know what's right or wrong, I kind of call BS on that. But this is what I say, though, Phil. Don't do anything that you wouldn't want done to your wife, with your wife, or your sister or your daughter. I just don't think it's so confusing or so hard to figure out what's appropriate and what isn't. Yeah. But I also think that there's a way around that. Either bring a colleague or you have it in a public place or you do it in a conference room. I mean, I just, I, I would hate for men in power positions to use that as a, as a weapon against women. You know, because a lot of deals happen, you know, with a, over a drink or on the golf course or, you know, hanging out, you know, deal, deal making is done. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it would be a shame for women to get left out of that because men are, quote, afraid. Yeah, I agree. So y'all need to figure out another way, Phil. Yeah. <laughs> y'all men people. Yeah. Y'all need to figure out another yeah, way. Y'all need to figure <laughs> yes, it out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Y'all yeah. do. Your top people are women, Phil. All my people are women out yeah. there. I got like five men, it seems, and all the rest <laughs> of them are women. I'm told Hollywood's a bunch of stars with sycophant yes men around them. I can't find anybody that doesn't argue with me every day. I got 300 women. Every one of them argues with me every day. I said, I don't want to do the show. Yes, you do. No, yeah. no, I don't. I don't want to do it. Yes, you do. We'll see and what a better man right. made you. Well, they're right every yeah. time. Yeah. I, that's what makes me so mad. Yes. Starting with your wife and your granddaughter. Yes. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh. Jay was trying to take Avery somewhere the other day, and he said, let's go in and we'll get you some ice cream. I have my pajamas on. You're six. It doesn't matter. I'm not going anywhere with my pajamas on. You can forget it. Well, how about I go in and buy you a jacket and we put it on? Well, okay. Hold it up and let me see it. (laughs) Hold it up and let me see it. Hold it up. Let me see the jacket. Wow. Just to go in and hold it up to the window. Okay. Bring it out. Bring it out. So hard to imagine Jay. I know he is a dad, but God, I remember Jay was a teenager. Oh, I know. I remember he was a teenager. Wow. Now he's got two kids, eight and six and a half. Can you believe it? Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah. I think it's great. So what's next for you? What do you do? Will you do this know. for 10 years? Will you do something different? I don't know. I don't. Let's see. I'm 63, so I don't see myself doing this in 10 years. But honest to God, Phil, I didn't think I'd be doing this. So I honestly don't know. I don't have an expiration date in mind. Yeah. I don't have that. I know ultimately I would like to be in California because I do love California and favorite daughter Kirby and favorite son Will both live in L.A. now. So I I know that I would like to be in California, Mm -hmm. but I I don't have an expiration date or really even a game plan in mind. You hiring over at your place? I play nicely with others. Yes, I know you play (laughs) nicely with others. If you do this for a long time, can you change what's happening in the perception of news. Half of America believes what Trump is saying. Half of America believes fake news. Yeah, I know. Only because he's deemed it so. But you can go to California and everybody out there is in therapy because he's president. Mm -hmm. But you go to the flyover states, that's not the case. Yeah, they're feeling really good, yeah. People live in a bubble. 
yeah. on east and west. Yeah, I know. But you go fly over, everybody's saying, how can this happen? Yeah. You go to Omaha, they ain't asking how this no, can happen. No, it makes perfect sense. They think the Russian thing is a witch hunt. They think yeah. it's all a big hoax. They think it's a big conspiracy. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know how we change that other than we, we just have to keep telling the truth. And we have to keep backing up what we're saying, too. There was a study done that said 90 plus percent of the coverage of Trump by the media was negative. What do you say to him about I, that? I've heard that. Because well, the truth is he has done some positive things. Yep. And I think we, listen, we had his campaign manager on today, Brad Brad Parscale, who's getting ready for the 2020 campaign. We're having the authors of the book Trumponomics about why it's working. And I think all you can do is, because you can't totally bash everything that he's done. And not for nothing, he defeated 16 professional politicians. Right. So, right. you know, he clearly struck a nerve. He clearly resonated. And a lot of people want to hear what he has to say. And I think we need to pay attention to that. We need to pay attention to issues that maybe people weren't zeroing in on. He raised he raised some very important issues in this country. Yeah. But yeah, I, I saw that study too. I don't think, I'll only speak at CBS, we are never deliberately trying to be some, trying to report something negative about the president. You know, what we report is exactly what he's doing. And if he doesn't like it, he does call it fake news or he calls it negative. Right. And, you know, I, I don't know how you get around that. Let me ask you this. I watched the Supreme Court hearings. Yeah. As did everybody. Yeah. I mean, it was like Hurricane, Hurricane Kavanaugh. The country was absorbed in these things. What did you think about the Supreme Court hearings? I thought that... Uh, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford was so brave to come and tell her story. And she admitted, she admitted before she sat down that she was terrified. She was terrified. And when she opened her mouth to speak, I was struck by the girlish quality of her voice. I was very surprised at that. But I also found her very believable and very credible. Listen, this is somebody who said that she was terrified to tell the story. And she also said that she's on the beach with friends trying to figure out what to do. And someone says, it's what we learn in school. Well, call your congressman, which is what she did. She seemed to have done all of the right things. And she put herself out there. Even people who said she was credi that she was a credible person. And, you know, we've been trying to talk to her. She's in hiding somewhere. She's not, she can't even go back home. So th that whole thing made me sad. On the other hand, uh, Brett Kavanaugh came. He was extremely angry. I, I didn't think that he was totally honest with the Senate Judiciary Committee. You had people from his past who had, you know, who had hung out with him, said that he drank to excess. Um, he totally denied all of that. And I just thought that, if you had to weigh who was telling the truth and who wasn't, I thought for many people it was clear. And, you know, after a while, his behavior at the Senate Judiciary Committee I thought was troubling since it's supposed to be by nonpartisan. I thought that was troubling. I thought the issues that he raised, I thought they produced enough people that showed that he was less than truthful. And he still became a Supreme Court justice. So I sat there and I was sort of I was surprised that that was the outcome. <clears throat> I was surprised that he was nominated. Well, let me ask you this. If he had been a Democrat and she had been a Republican, do you think that everybody that was supporting Kavanaugh would have flipped to the other side and everybody supporting her would have flipped to the other side and we would have had exactly the same debate? Exactly the same circus of a hearing? Yeah, I do, because it's gotten so partisan. I mean, you know, people are terrified on both sides of going against their own party, even when they think their own. I've seen people say this to me privately. You know, Jeff Flake is a really good example when he said that, you know, he called for let's have the hearing, let's have the investigation. And he was asked on 60 Minutes with Scott Pelley, would you have been comfortable doing this if you were still running again? And he said, no. He said, no, I would not be comfortable because it, 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 it because no one is listening. I thought, how sad is that? That had he not been running again, had he been running again, he wouldn't even he wouldn't even have behaved the way that he did. 
So to me, it's not even about Democrat or Republican. It's about right and what's wrong. But my point is, you could have flipped I hear and you. had exactly, exactly the, same the same thing, thing, which means it has nothing to do with the issue. It is total partisan, partisan politics, politics, which is not what it's supposed to be. You well, would have had all of the people standing up, making the speeches and all. Yeah. They would have just changed the topic. They would have just changed the slant. It would have been exactly the same circus. Wow, that's interesting. If she had been a Republican, he would have been a Democrat. But everybody came out of that, Phil, saying that they believed her. Even people like, even the president in the beginning said she was compelling. Mm -hmm. And then he took a turn. But even he in the beginning said she was compelling. I think after her testimony, they were very worried. And he was told, you need to go in there and you need to, listen, he came out swinging from the, ver from the moment he sat down. And I think he was advised that he needs to take a different tactic because it was very different from the interview that he had done a, a, a few days before with, when he was sitting there with his wife, you know, basically, I'm a choir boy. He didn't say those words exactly. But his, his tone had dra dramatically changed from that interview to when he sat down. Well, you know what research shows? What? Research shows that when people are falsely accused, yeah. they are pissed off from minute one to, till the very end. Yeah. They're never understanding. They're never, gee, I get it. And he says that he they was falsely accused. They are pissed accused. off from minute one So you're saying that's why he be behaved the way he did. I think somebody read the research and they coached him and said, you should be outraged from minute one. Well, I think he was coached he to do that, which again, has nothing to do with the truth. It's just, here's your coaching. And he was coached to write a letter uh, to the New York Times, I believe, or was it Wall Street Journal? I can't remember which, where he where he apologized for his behavior, but said that you know he had been falsely accused and that he was very angry. I mean, so even that he was said, listen, you need to you need to put a letter in there, you need to get your word out because your behavior was very yep. uh, concerning to a lot of people, right. and you're losing a lot of people. So I was dismayed to hear that. Yeah. I was dismayed to hear that. It just worries me that nobody seemed well, to really care what actually mattered. How do you see us getting on on track, getting back on track? Is it possible for us as a country to get on get back on track? I, think, I believe it is. I think it is, but it requires everybody to start understanding. I don't have to love everything that you say or do yeah. to love you. Right. Right. I don't have to agree with everything you right. say I or say do that too. Yeah. to then be great friends with you. Yeah. Yeah. I can have a disagreement and then we can go to lunch. We can compartmentalize our yes. differences and still treat each other with dignity and respect, exactly. compassion and caring, and compartmentalize our differences. We may disagree about forestry or any political issues or football teams or abortion issues or what but that doesn't mean we can't say okay i respect your right to disagree yeah let's go have lunch and talk about things yeah. we do agree on yeah yeah and that's gone away and i've always believed that if my views won't withstand challenge they're not worth holding mm -hmm. mm. i was reading a book about satan when i was growing up and my pastor came and said what are you doing give me that I said, why? He said, you shouldn't read that. It will poison your mind. I said, look, if these religious teachings won't withstand challenge, they're not worth holding. I want to know the enemy. Yeah. I want to know Satan. I want to know the enemy. And that's he said, good. that's blasphemy. You shouldn't read that. How old were you at the time? Do you remember? 14. Wow. I said, well, you can take that one and I'll go check out it. I got it out of the library. I said, I'll go check out another one. <laughs> wow. So he gave it back to me. So you were a rebel even then. Phil even Brown. then. Yes. As soon as I was old enough, I was out of that church, I guarantee you. <laughs> Tell me about this book. So it's called Note to Self, and it, you know, my name is on the cover, but I can't claim credit. It's a compilation. It's one of the most popular things we do on CBS This Morning. Yeah, it's very, very people. cool. I, I do like the friend. You should do a Note to Self, Phil. You think? Phil, yes. Would you be interested? I think, I think that would be good. I would like that. Yeah. I'm going to suggest it. So, so we, we take people, famous, some famous, some not so famous, mm -hmm. and talk about what are their big life lessons, what, what, would they, what did they, when they were younger, what did they think? It's sort of your note to your younger self, yeah. how, what you're concerned about, what you're worried about, how you turned out. 
It's a very popular feature, and we've taken it and put it in a book form. I like it because I believe in continuity of ID. I believe you got to re- stay in touch with who you were all the way back, good, bad, or indifferent. Mm-hmm. You got to stay in mm-hmm. touch with who you were. That's why I listen to oldie music. To what music? Oldie. Oldies like what? Yeah, I mean, back to the 60s, Motown and uh-huh. stuff like that, because that was an era that I don't want to forget. Music transports you emotionally, not intellectually, but emotionally. You hear songs that identify with different things that were important to you during that time. I'm fascinated by you can hear an old record from years ago and still know all the words, but can't remember something that's current right now. Yeah. I'm always fascinated by that. My boys keep telling me, Dad, your oldies are getting old. (laughs) So when is Gail going to marry? Do you have anybody for me? You know, I used to really want to get married again, Phil, but, and I'm still open to it, still open to it. But what you would like is to have somebody to share your life with. That's what I would like. So it's not necessarily marriage that I'm seeking, but, and the word boyfriend sounds so silly at 63, but you do want somebody that you can share your life with. And I just haven't met anybody like that. I have it, but I'm definitely, definitely open to it. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Listen, I would go online if if I could do it and people not know it's me. Yeah. Do you get lonely? No, I never really get lonely because my life is really full and I do a lot of great fun stuff. So that's not normally something that I experience or feel. I can honestly say that. But at the end of the day, you know, like for instance, this weekend, I was so happy to be home alone and not have to worry about anybody because I've had just a crazy, crazy, crazy week. So in many respects, it's nice to be able to come home and not have to worry about anybody but yourself. But that said, I think everybody wants somebody, I I call it couple speak. You know, when I was married, my ex would say, do you want anything from the store? You know, I'm on my way home, do we need any milk? I mean, I like that kind of, uh, you know, the important things in a relationship are the day-to-day intimacies, if you will. It's not the big things. Yeah. It's the day-to-day of living life. So I would like that. It's important that somebody cares where you are. Yes. Other than the day. my doorman. Yeah. You know, like, if, yeah. like if I'm not down by X time, you better call upstairs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it would be nice to have somebody that, you know that really is concerned about you. And I have that certainly with my favorite daughter and favorite son, but I think ultimately you want to have somebody you can share your life with. Yeah. Because they have their own lives too. You well, know? sure. It's nice to create memories with somebody exactly. that you can reflect on. Exactly. And you have so, that in many respects. It's just not in a romantic way. Exactly right. But, you know, right. I think a little romance is good, Bill. Yes, it is. So, and you I know, keep my ear to the ground. Yeah, there's different people, but nobody that, I, that I'm prepared to say, Ta-da! Final comment question, because I want to respect your time. How do you feel about being inducted into the Broadcasting and Cable Hall of Fame? Uh, Phil, I still can't believe it, to be honest with you. You know, when they called me and I said, "Um, for me to do what, when? So I'm very, I am very, very flattered by it. And you look at the past inductees and you think you're now going to be part of that group. It's it's sort of overwhelming to me. It is. I was inducted two years ago. I know. And I saw your when name I looked there. at the list, it's yes, like me, t- me too, Phil. Holy shit! Yes, me too. <laughs> like that's, seriously, that's what I that's what I said. And so I'm trying not to be because somebody said, "Oh God, Gail, stop acting like a girl." You know, like I don't know. I'm sure. Blah, blah, stop. A guy never says that. What you ought to do is say, "Yeah," you know. And and I do feel that, but I'm also very like, wow. I'm also very, wow, me? Yeah, I was really flattered, but I didn't have any of that, really. It was like, okay. (laughs) That's what I'm saying. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, It was like, I was flattered, but it was like, okay. (laughs) Yeah, I know. See, I didn't have the okay part. It's taken me a while to get to the okay part. Yeah, but you're there now, right? I'm there. I'm there and really looking forward to it. The actual event and ceremony is kind of long and problematic, as you know, having been there, I'm sure. But yeah. But it's the being yes. and the, being able to say to yourself, you're in the yeah. Hall of Fame. Yeah, I and mean, to say thank you. Yeah, yeah it's true. Come on. I it's mean, the that's... being in the being, yeah. And it is well-deserved. What did you say? It's in the being, right? Yeah. Phil, is that what you said? It's yeah. in the being. And it's well-deserved. You put in a lot of time. I'm going to write that down, too. It's in the being. Yeah. Like being in the room, being in the... What do you, 
being in the moment. What do you mean? It's in the being. It's your being in the Hall of Fame. You okay. just are. It'd be better if they just mailed it to you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can skip the event. <laughs> you just are. You just are a yeah. Hall of Famer. I know that now when they list it, your name is in that group. That's right. It's an amazing group. Yeah, because forever, for the whole rest of your life, they can say, Hall of Famer, Gail I King. I know. There, there is something, I'm telling you, very, very, very wow about that. Yeah, and when they look at the list, they say, well, who's she in there with? They go, oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Gail, thanks for well, doing thank this. thank you, Phil. This, this was, was fun. This was, I thought it was fun, too. Yeah. You are so easy to talk to. <laughs>